Today we're in the Catskills at a relatively high elevation. In fact, one of the tallest peaks, Slide Mountain, is right behind us. And we're filming along the banks of the Esopus Creek, uh, probably one of the most famous trout streams in the world. Today we want to talk about a group of plants called the bryophytes that includes the mosses and the liverworts. Uh, the mosses, I'm sure you're aware of, most people know about mosses, uh, but the liverworts are a lesser known group. These plants are very transitional, that is, between water and land, and we'll talk about that transitional nature later on. Now, the bryophytes are considered the most advanced of the lower plants. They're considered advanced because the bryophytes still form embryos. They're considered lower plants because they have no vascular tissue. That is, they have no internal support, and as you'll see in a few moments, this has greatly limited their distribution on land because the vascular tissue provides support and internal transport for higher plants, and of course the mosses and liverworts don't have that. Another major limitation is that the bryophytes do not have pollen, that is the sperm still has to swim from the male plants to the female plants. Now, we'll talk about the mosses first since they're the best known. And remember that when we're talking about the mosses, we're talking about plants that live in very confined habitat. Uh, because they require a lot of moisture for reproduction, for sexual reproduction, uh, you'll usually find them in darker areas in the forest. Now, because of this, they've evolved to photosynthesize efficiently at relatively low light intensities. Now, let's move down and take a look at some of these moss plants so we can get an idea of exactly what the plant body or the thallus of the plant looks like. Here's a collection of mosses in front of us. And you'll notice that this first group of mosses, you can see that they do have leafy-like and stem-like structures. They're not vascular, and that's why they're so small, because they have no support. But those leafy-like uh, projections in the stalks do have chlorophyll, and they can photosynthesize. The male plants, the thallus of the plant, contains reproductive structures called antheridia, and these antheridia internally form sperm. The female plants, on the other hand, have reproductive structures called archegonia, and internally these archegonia form eggs or ova. Now the archegonia has evolved to be perfectly suited for reproduction with motile sperm. There's a bowl-shaped section of the archegonia uh, in which the ovum or egg lies. Then there's a neck canal that comes up out of the archegonium that ultimately the sperm must swim from the male plant to the female plant down through that neck into the bowl-shaped area of the archegonia and fertilize the egg. Now you would think it would be very difficult for sperm to swim across these plants from one point to another point for fertilization. But remember that in these colonies of mosses, that the male and female plants grow in very tight groups so that actually the swimming of the sperm, uh, the distance it swims, is very, very short. It may be as little as a couple of millimeters. So that fertilization is not all that difficult a process. But if you recall, I said they're very limited by moist habitat. And of course, one of the reasons is they have to have moisture, the sperm do, to swim from the male to the female plant. Now, once that sperm penetrates in through the archegonia to the egg, a zygote is formed. And since that zygote is retained by the female portion of the plant, it forms an embryo. As I mentioned, these are the first groups of plants to form an embryo. Now, the embryo is retained within the female plant. In higher forms that we'll talk about in subsequent lectures, this embryo is surrounded by a seed, of course, and ultimately that seed can be distributed and dispersed away from the plants. In this case, the embryo is retained, and from the embryo develops the asexual stage. That's the sporophyte stage. And in fact, you can see these small, brushy structures 
sticking up out of the thallus of the moss plants. These brushy structures are the sporophytes. And if you notice at the very tip of the sporophyte, there's a small uh, sac-like structure called a capsule. It's actually a modified sporangium. And inside that capsule, asexual spores are formed. Now remember the sperm and egg uh, in the moss plants and the gametophytes was sexual reproduction. These spores that are formed in the capsule are asexual spores. When they're mature, the capsule ruptures. There's some ruptured capsules right here and from which the spores have already been liberated. These spores fall to the ground, and when conditions are favorable, they will then develop back into new moss plants. Now, mosses have a great deal of ecological importance. Uh, one of the major imports of the moss plants is as food for other organisms. Mosses, for example, are important as food for insects, uh, for certain types of small mammals, and for certain types of birds. Mosses are also very important as a food source for other types of organisms as well. Mosses are part of succession, primary succession on land, a little bit of what we talked about when we discussed the lichens. Mosses are the next stage in primary succession in a terrestrial habitat. And along with the lichens, they help prepare the ground uh, for other stages in succession. Not only do they initiate soil production along with the lichens, but as these mosses die and decompose, they also provide organic matter. And since they grow in very tight clumps, they tend to retain this soil and organic matter. That is, they tend to uh, prevent erosion of that soil. Now, following the moss stage, depending on how much light is available to that habitat, uh, you might see grasses start to develop now that there's soil and organic matter available. You may see ferns, if it's a shadier area, start to develop, and ultimately into the shrub and tree and grass stage. Probably the greatest importance, however, of the mosses is associated with one genus called sphagnum. Now, sphagnum moss <clears throat> grows in very swampy areas. It's got a, a relatively confined habitat. But what's unusual about it is that sphagnum grows in layers. Sphagnum, as part of its growth pattern, deposits acid in the environment. This acid tends to slow down the action of bacteria, so the decomposition uh, comes almost to a complete halt. As this sphagnum grows layer on top of layer, not only is this, the lower levels acidic, but also oxygen is cut off. That is, they tend to become anaerobic. Well, the combination of anaerobiosis and acidity pretty much guarantees that those lower layers do not decompose. Eventually, they form what are known as peat bogs. Now, some of these peat layers and bogs, and by the way, they're found in vast areas of the world in the British Isles, in Canada, in parts of Asia. Some of these bogs can be meters deep. Now, bogs can be actually used uh, as a source of fuel. They dig up the peat, dry it, and burn it. And of course, it's a cheap source. Unfortunately, the acid that these plants produce is sulfuric acid, so that the uh, byproduct of burning this peat is sulfur dioxide, which of course is one of the problems we have with acid precipitation worldwide. Peat can also be used commercially for shipping plants, or it can be used as a dressing uh, around nurseries, uh, around beds that you have on your property, flower beds, etc. It's a great soil conditioner for sandy soil because peat retains about three times, because it's very spongy, only partially decomposed, uh, contains about three times the amount of water of average soil. 